Few Twin Peaks podcast stars as atmospheric as Counter Esperanto, a collaboration between Jubu Brousseau and Carl Eckler, which charts the areas where Twin Peaks meets weird fiction. This is true even when the episodes consist of them just riffing off of one another, in the no man's land where voices meet in the ether. Very few of their episodes were recorded together in person, even before the pandemic. But it's all the more true in the episodes which combine sound effects with evocative readings of classic works by Lovecraft or other authors, creating a soundscape to match the tenor of the ideas that they're toying with in their more free-form discussions. Counter Esperanto launched around 2016-17, to when the return was just on the horizon and the secret history offered tantalizing touchpoints between the visions of Lynch Frost and, say, Lovecraft. In the years after this season, they branched off into more diverse topics, changing their subtitle from Tangents About Twin Peaks to Winds of the Weird. Nonetheless, they've recently returned to their roots, releasing thick, bracing brews every few months, in-depth discussions with guests like John Thorne, Robbie King, John Bernardi, and Lindsay Stamhorse, discussing a set of Season 3 episodes, although usually they wander all over the season, depending where the conversation goes. They've almost reached the finale, with mystery guests, I have my suspicions, waiting in the wings to join them. We're going to talk about the concept behind their podcast, the overlap and the differences between weird fiction and the TV show, their histories with Twin Peaks and the area of Washington where they grew up, and how it does and doesn't relate to the fictional town, as well as what it's like to look back on a show which itself dissects and repels nostalgia from the potentially nostalgic viewpoint of five years later and lots of other topics. They even have a question or two for me. As always, the first part of this discussion will be public right here, and then we'll continue talking on Patreon for the $5 a month tier. Join up to access not just this exchange, but all of the earlier full conversations as well. But before we get there, I want to update you on my own personal work. Uh, First off, I continued the Lost in Twin Peaks public podcast, uh, covering season three on the fifth anniversary of each episode until last week, through part 10. Then I had to pause for a number of reasons. I'll probably resume around November if I continue through the uh, rest of the return by Christmas. And then in 2023, I'll cover all of season two, which I jumped over to get to Firewalk with me in the return earlier this spring. I also just recently caught up with Patreon advances of the Twin Peaks character series, in which I preview three entries each month for my patrons. This is a series that's going to probably start next year, where I go through all of the characters in Twin Peaks of one degree or another, you know, the minor ones get little uh, roundups. And then as we go along, we uh, cover the characters in terms of screen time uh, up to the most prominent character. And I have uh, written entries on each of them. This is based off of a series I did in 2017. I got up to the top 20. I had to pause because the return was about to come on and now I'm finally revamping it. So for the belated uh, June studies that I just released for patrons that were for that month, I covered the 86th, 85th, and 84th characters ranked by screen time. Long entries where I go into their personal journey, their uh, what they tell us about the town of Twin Peaks, the episodes they're in, the uh, backstories of the actors, which are often really fascinating, all this stuff. Now, I won't be giving away who these uh, three characters are, so you can become a patron to not just learn their identities, but also read the entire entries months before they'll be made public. Elsewhere on Patreon, I published my monthly bonus podcast, which covered Adam Curtis's hypnotic war on terror documentary, The Power of Nightmares. I also have a Patreon podcast for July, which should be going up, uh, hopefully it's already up this morning. If not, it will be up in a day or two, uh, covering uh, Coffee and Cigarettes, the Jim Jarmusch film, in addition to some other uh, updates of my activity and what I've been watching or listening to, etc. I also publicly made guest appearances on the Obnoxious and Anonymous YouTube channel and um, the Uncut Gems podcast to discuss Firewalk with me which uh, is a Patreon uh, episode for them, but it's still, they they made it public for a month or two. It's still public, so you can jump over and check it out now. And then there's also a a ticketed event I did where you can buy a ticket, donate to charity. It's a sprawling online conference where you had tons of podcasters and actors and authors and different people involved with Twin Peaks come on and have group discussions. So I was on a panel about podcasts. This was called Wyndham's Cabin, so you can check that out too. And on my public podcast feeds, I discussed the Astaire Rogers musical Swing Time, and uh, that kicked off a new season on the Lost in the Movies podcast, which is devoted to classic Hollywood. 
And I also launched a mini-series on my Twin Peaks Cinema podcast called Ray's Haunted 50s, which begins with a comparison between Twin Peaks and Nicholas Ray's noir on Dangerous Ground. Okay, with all of that out of the way, let's now welcome my guest for Twin Peaks Conversations in July, Jubal Brousseau and Carl Eckler of Counter Esperanto. Why don't you tell the audience, uh, those of them who have not uh, encountered your podcast before, what you guys do, how it relates to Twin Peaks. Basically, it's a connection between Twin Peaks and weird fiction that I think is, you know, you go all over the place, but that's kind of at the, uh, that's like the seed from which it all sprouts, I feel like. Carl and I, when we, uh, around the same time that we discovered Twin Peaks, probably a little earlier, truth be told, uh, we also discovered the work of H.P. Lovecraft and other authors of weird fiction. And I was a lifelong lover of horror movies and books, but it was generally Stephen King or Dean Koontz that I was picking up. Well, there was something a great more bleak, a great deal more bleak talking about forces beyond human comprehension uh, from a past so deep we have to talk about it uh, in more time than the known universe has existed. And that's kind of what Lovecraft brought in. Uh, and um, I'm just gonna, if you'll bear with me, I'm gonna read a, a brief line. There's yeah, a go for line. It. A, Read as a, much as you want. I love you guys' readings you do on this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, th there is a famous line in Lovecraft. It's the first paragraph of The Call of Cthulhu. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but someday the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Uh, it's just one of my all-time favorite paragraphs ever written. People can say what they will about Lovecraft as a writer, but that 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 is a... Um, because what, what it really does is it gets at the central horror of Lovecraft. It's not necessarily that these monsters or elder gods or whatever he calls them are the problem. Not exactly. It's the knowledge itself of places, things, and processes beyond our understanding. Uh, so as such, we have never known the whole story of our existence, but it is possible to glean just enough to do some real damage to ourselves or possibly to the world. And this is one of the through lines that we see between classic weird fiction like Lovecraft's and Twin Peaks. Uh, we see the return, um, well, when we see in the return that Agent Cooper is just such a person, uh, and Carla said in our show that uh, his tragic heroic flaw is just that, he's a hero, right? Uh, he's brilliant on a human scale. Sheriff Truman and other characters are blown away by his deductive reasoning and his intuition, but once he's in lodge space, this is a Bernardi term, which I love, uh, <laughs> uh, he's out of his depth and, argu and arguably in that context, his intelligence and intuition is more of a liability. And so rather than gawk and go mad, he thinks he can figure it out. And that's ultimately his downfall. Uh, that's the connection to weird fiction that we have uh, with Twin Peaks. Amongst um, others, you know, like UFOs. Yeah, I mean, and the stuff that, that I think the thing that actually brought us into doing the uh, podcast was, uh, well, it was the secret history. Um, mm. fi we finally found a way in when Frost released the secret history. All of a sudden we had this compendium of all the nerdy stuff he liked, right? <laughs> uh, that was sort of informing his side of things where, you know, Lynch was kind of going off in his abstract, intuitive way. Uh, Mark Frost. But that's when it really, it really locked it down for us. That, yeah. Hey, uh, Twin Peaks is not something outside of weird fiction. It is an overlapping Venn diagram with weird fiction. Right. It, it's, um, we didn't realize it for, in my case, like 20 years, mm -hmm. but yeah, Twin Peaks is a, a thing that, um, it, it's a, one of those weird problems in topology. It uh, touches every other space inside of weird fiction at very interesting intersections. And our mission statement is to tease out exactly where and why and what those intersections are beautifully put carl yeah well before we get into some of the connections and and maybe um breaks that twin peaks has from weird fiction what would be this this sort of starter definition you would give for somebody listening who 
maybe is a little familiar with Lovecraft, but not much else, or maybe not even Lovecraft, like how would you uh, maybe not define, but suggest weird fiction, let's say. Why don't you take a crack at this, Carl? I think you've had some good ones over the years. <laughs> um, I'll paraphrase um, The Weird and the Eerie by... Um... Mark Fisher? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the Eerie is um, more typified by ghost stories um, and tales of hauntings and the, the spooky stuff that runs makes a shiver run up your spine because there's a presence that should be an absence. Mm -hmm. um, and weird fiction is there's a thing that should not be. At least, I can't remember exactly how Fisher stated it, but it's a imposition into our worldview and our world from someplace outside it where different rules apply. Right. And it's um, something so disturbing that just our knowledge of it is enough to destroy us. Um, yeah. It's um, kind of the op opposite of the... Uh, of the blinking angels from Doctor Who, you know the things that move so very fast that um, um, they seem to teleport, but they can only move if nobody's looking at them. The weird mm. can only move towards you when somebody's looking at it. It only exists when somebody looks at it. And the, that that very much suggests to me the beginning of uh, the Return Part One with the experiment in the glass box. Mm -hmm. the act of mm -hmm. looking that seems to well actually i take that back a little bit because they're not they're looking you know they're they're uh looking at each other when when it finally appears right um but then when they look back there's a there's a sort of weird relationship there between watching not watching and uh you know what you're watching watching you right well, Carl and I, on the when we were first covering, you know, uh, we didn't do episode by episode because we're just not e e equipped to do that with our time. But uh, but every like four episodes or so, we would do an episode, and we were like, uh, we we talked about that, you know, um, resembling a camera or a camera obscura, you know, uh, this idea that it's projecting something from another space into our space, uh, and you know, when you see the the way that the experiment moves. Uh, it doesn't seem to be like operating in w within the same physical rules. For for one thing, it's floating, but it's also jittering, you know, back and forth. It has the shaky thing that that sort of uh, I think in latter years uh, Lynch has done this a lot by shaking the camera and creating really disturbing things. I mean, he's still doing that with his Friday weather reports, right, <laughs> on his own face. Uh, if you can believe it you know uh and so um he's still doing that he's still doing the same thing with his uh, with his laptop or whatever it is that he did uh to film the experiment this sort of watery shakiness and um and and uh and also incorporating not just the special effects but incorporating within the special effects the nature of film itself uh you know in the mauve zone in the third part we see uh you know the 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 artifacting that's happening when he's uh you know rather than just filming everything backwards and reversing it um he's taking the footage and scrubbing back and forth and you can even see the the image quality deteriorate when he does so and he doesn't care this is what he wants is this effect this back and forth you know and uh so um that it sort of creates this sort of weirdness that is embedded in the act of filmmaking itself uh which is something that most people you know I, I think that's something that people kind of bounced off of a little bit some people actually thought that maybe the red room was computer generated like like a video game almost because it was so high key you know if you go back and watch the original uh you know uh, pilot you know european pilot version of the red room it's grungy almost right mm, yeah <laughs> and yeah, uh, the and dirty the, floor the dirty floor you know and people have said that you know and i think it's even true in the return it's not black it's brown it's coffee colored mm. you know um uh coffee and cream yeah yeah it is. yeah yeah um but but yeah the the weird is basically it is a uh it is an an uh a sort of a dismantling or an intrusion upon our normal ideas of fixed laws of nature and uh 
and that was something that Lovecraft talked about is like we need, you know, it's ghosts and vampires and werewolves, you know, they're basically folk, you know, we all know once you understand something's nature, you know, you got your silver and you got your uh, your stakes through the heart and they can't see themselves in mirrors and silver bullets and all the rest. You know how to fight this thing. It's it starts to become just a mechanistic thing uh, and it's and it's rooted in the folklore of, uh, you know, paganism, but also Christianity, you know, so people kind of knew what they were getting with a vampire story. Uh, what Lovecraft wanted was a fear, was a, uh, a horror that would scare atheists. And how do you do that? Well, atheists, you know, and Lovecraft himself was an atheist, uh, but he, he's, a, you know, atheists, they don't necessarily think they have everything figured out, but they sort of have this idea that I think, I think I know what the universe isn't. And it's this idea of an intrusion upon what you think is just sort of safe assumptions in the world. So you, You've touched on a few things there in terms of Twin Peaks and weird fiction, Mark Frost and David Lynch. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I'm curious about is you, you mentioned secret history being kind of your way in, in a way to kind of connecting these two, these two worlds. And that's obviously through Mark Frost. Mm -hmm. When The Return came out, what were the, the sort of Lynchian aspects of it that you felt not necessarily negated, but countered uh, frost's approach and what were the parts where you felt like maybe he found his own way to weird fiction that was distinct from frost you already kind of uh kind of touched on one aspect of it which is he's a visual artist um, mm -hmm. whereas frost is more of a literary mind so uh, his approach to the weird is going to incorporate that in a way that uh, uh frost certainly doesn't maybe arguably lovecraft and other authors don't quite as well i mean i think mm -hmm. Um, Lovecraft uh, is, is sort of infamous for not for trying not to define certain things that he was uh, evoking on the page, right? Right. Um, I think Carl, I think you've talked about on uh, on our show. You talked about uh, in, in a way that Lovecraft almost by uh, almost tries to he chooses not to define by almost overdefining. You know, he throws adjectives mm. at something almost in as as like as if there's a, a panic happening of trying to describe what it's what's happening. Uh, this has been mistaken for bad writing. And I mean I think he has a he has a flaw he has a flawed author and you know and a virulent racist and all the rest. But the thing is is that he had a uh he uh uh when it came to the way that Lovecraft would uh write he would almost he would throw so many words at it because because this is indescribable I'm going to try anyway. Uh and now of course and Lynch by is a failing at explicate that it is in fact indescribable. Right. Um now Carl, would you say that what, what Lynch does uh, when it comes to, um, well, what Lynch does is he just sort of doesn't even try to do that, right? This is indescribable. <laughs> um, what I am showing you, what I am showing you is indescribable, which is an interesting thing for a visual artist to do because, you know, you know we know that Lynch is uh, very distrustful of words, uh, of, the, of the, the ability of words to convey uh, Meaning, at least insofar as what he's trying, what he's trying to, what he's concerned with as an artist, um, which is to, uh, um, I think, uh, Joel, I can't remember who you were talking to, but in one of your recent episodes, you're talking to somebody where they're saying that um, Lynch is just uses this blanket term idea, right? Mm. I need to be true to the idea, uh, and uh, and whatever doesn't fit the idea, we throw out. And, and it's such a almost naively vague term because he's trying to keep true to this feeling that he's having. And, and if the thing that he's seeing through that little, you know, monitor when he's filming it isn't true to that idea, then he stops and he changes something and he, and he reworks it until it works, whether that's a performance or a, or a piece of set dressing. Um, I think that's something that's, you know, I mean, it may be in keeping with the, the, the first thing, that you know, the thing that, you're ta that we've already talked about, which is different from Frost. But I think that he is such, you know, Frost calls himself a, a Jungian. Um, and what, what was it you said, Carl, recently when we were talking to, uh, was it Bernardi? Was, you, you're saying that uh, the silver apples of the moon is, is the realm of Lynch and the golden apples of the sun is Frost, right? Hmm. Uh, like Lynch is the... Uh, the subconscious 
in in action and and frost is the conscious mind trying to connect with that subconscious and so it makes sense that i think that the connection that frost and lynch have together is that frost is a young in and, and if and if lynch is unconcerned with that term well that's in keeping of his nature as the silver apple <laughs> uh that's true enough um yeah, yeah i think that works very well <laughs> uh, one thing i was curious about was you you know obviously we're talking about the overlap of weird fiction and twin peaks and that's where your podcast kind of rests and uh, emerges from but what about the differences if you can sort of categorize weird fiction and then find a distinction from twin peaks what would those be and and what interests you about those as well um i there's two big pillars of difference that at least present themselves to me um, the first is that weird fiction isn't necessarily serialistic. Uh, it's um, uh, serialism, surrealism, which I cannot pronounce today, <laughs> is you know about the the unexpected and the the not necessarily impossible, but the improbable and the illogical Mm -hmm. um the weird is is that at least to our viewpoint of it but it's not all that it is it's um has to do a great deal with more um cosmic viewpoint more of a disinterest in human affairs um and it tends more towards usually the horrible than uh, than surrealism. It's more of a human experience, and it's the humans that are that are interacting with the bizarre activities or bizarre situations. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, um, a Tati film would be a kind of surrealistic, um, but um, Mon Onk never gets eaten by a gelatinous thing from beyond the stars so (laughs) and leading out from that is the other pillar where twin peaks is uh, all about human connection whereas uh, weird fiction especially as lovecraft saw it was all about mood he would go to great lengths to create a verbal black magic uh, that provokes mood but he all of his characters were just kind of cardboard cutouts um, of people he knew or idealized versions of himself. Um, There are a lot of professors in Lovecraft's work because he felt kind of ashamed about never actually going on to higher education. Contrast that with Twin Peaks and, you know, it's all about these wonderful characters. And that's the big difference. The, um, interesting way around from the germ of weird fiction being Lovecraft was actually accused of um, (laughs) of being like a neutron bomb destroying people and leaving buildings intact because he liked mood and architecture and didn't give much of a fig for anything else Mm. or at least that's how people saw him he's Mm -hmm. a human being so much more complex than anyone one cardboard cutout can make it but yeah an ensemble cast where there's an odd mood about it certainly there's impossible things that happen there's intrusions from the outside that's absolutely a hallmark of the weird but it's supported by the interactions of people whereas the weird is not necessarily that it's usually about a small group or a single person experiencing something impossible. Yeah, that's a good distinction. And uh, so, what you know, what you're talking about when you're bringing in these other elements, of course, is this is the you know the the famous sort of side of Twin Peaks. Is much has been made that they were reacting to nighttime soap operas. Uh, you know, their the contemporaries, Beverly Hills Nine or Two and O, where you have like uh, teenagers. You know, it's like a you know teenage soaps. Uh, film noir comes in a lot with some of the character names, <clears throat> and um, 
And of course, uh, one of Lynch's favorite films, uh, uh, Vertigo. You know, you have Madeline. You know, there, there's like the, the, this the idea of of uh, Laura Palmer and Madeline being um, identical cousins. You know, um, so all of these things are coming in sort of from the from melodrama uh, that was kind of ripe at the time. And I think it was something that Lindsay Stamus was talking about in our in our most recent episode, where uh, you know, it's it's the return is sort of a comment on, you know, the current state of television. Uh, you know, so what's coming out now, John Thorne was saying that when he, uh, you know, met Mark Frost, you know, saying um, Mark Frost assured him that, yes, we're aware that we're in at sort of a peak TV right now. This is premier television. Uh, and I think you're going to like what we have in store, you know. <clears throat> so, the, you know, it's it's all about reacting, you know, to the zeitgeist, not only the zeitgeist, but sort of the prevalent uh, media trends at the time. Uh, and there's been a lot of strange TV, you know, there was, there was True Detective and there was, you know, there was a number of things that were, that were coming out before the return, you know, and so it's like, how are they going to push the envelope? Well, they showed us. <laughs> <laughs> the envelope done be pushed. Yeah. <laughs> It's interesting when you describe, uh, it almost sounds like a sort of a humanism versus an anti-humanism or mm -hmm. non-humanism uh, in weird fiction, because in that light, it sounds like Frost is both the kind of a vector of the connection to weird fiction and also kind of the uh, pivot away from it in a way, because he is the one who is more engaged with some of this lore and this direct history of of the weird but then also the one i think who is more interested in telling a story i, I wouldn't say m more than lynch necessarily about telling a story about a person but maybe more interested in telling a story about multiple people than lynch is mm -hmm. well you know uh, uh, the moment that we serve that well the moment that i realized that oh we may have a way in here because we you know carl and i had, ta had talked about doing a podcast and we tried a couple we have a couple of recordings of uh of a weird fiction podcast that we tried prior to this uh and it just kind of didn't work because because we just we needed some sort of through line and the way we actually found that was i think it was christian hartleben was on twin peaks unwrapped and mentioned uh the character Cyril Pons which uh Frost is the character that Frost plays very briefly in both you know in both series and um that is a riff on Solar Pons by who's the author Carl um that's little Augie Derleth uh, yeah August, August Derleth. Derleth yeah which was who you know uh, a friend and acolyte i guess of of hp lovecraft so this is going sort of deeper and this isn't just somebody he's not referencing lovecraft he's referencing like one of lovecraft's friends that was on, went on to be his publisher and so a moment there was just like uh it, it just hearing christian talk about that suddenly made me you know it gave me pause i remember the moment i was like listening to it in my headphones and i stopped and thought yeah frost actually is probably more steeped in this than we realize and then I think it was soon, it was a couple months later that the uh, Secret History came out. And th that was sort of the catalyst where we thought we should, we should do this about a hybrid podcast about Twin Peaks and weird fiction. Because there is a lot about Twin Peaks that is not weird, the weird, weird fiction. Um, and the, but the parts that are, are so very unique to that series and uh, you know it's in the tradition of of essentially you know because like you know we talk about there's uh, the series is always as carl said is about this connection of, of these human characters um but when the weird interjects you get you have these beings that seem to be you know are they imaginary are they are they somebody trying to communicate to us this is kind of getting back to that letter that i sent to Stephen m back in the day are they building a lexicon is this somebody that's building a lexicon because they don't know how to communicate with us because we're not on the same plane and i think the re the return i'm not going to say proved that but it was it definitely just kind of it expanded it in ways that nobody could possibly predict where now we suddenly it's not just a red room where time goes forwards backwards but you have you know the fireman's lair and you have you know we're actually able to see more of the room above the convenience store and we're seeing like the the room that uh jeffries is in all of this stuff you know it's it's blown wide open mm. and this is existing in the same space where 
uh, Andy and Lucy are having a cute argument over which chair to buy. And then when uh, Andy's out of eye shot, she buys the chair that he wants. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that is the nature of Twin Peaks, because if it was all one or the other, it, you know, we wouldn't be talking about it right now. You know, it's 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 creating this gumbo, you know, uh, uh, it's completely unique, but it is uh, I still posit the, the greatest ex expression of the weird on television. So your podcast has kind of uh, as it's gone along, you know, you've you've ridden the wave where it takes you. You started with the secret history. I, as I recall, you had a lot of thematic kind of episodes where you would talk about certain elements of Twin Peaks. As the return was on, you were covering parts of it, chunks of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you kind of branched off a little and were doing, um, you did a lot of readings. You did a lot of explorations of other kind of tangential ideas. I think actually the subtitle of your podcast, if I'm not mistaken, is Tan is it tangents related to Twin Peaks? Or <laughs> we just call it tangents about Twin Peaks. Tangents yeah. about Twin Peaks, right. <laughs> yeah. So you've had, uh, you know, you've both kind of ridden the wave within episodes, but then also I think your podcast as a whole has kind of shifted over time. And recently you've come back to Twin Peaks, which is um, one of several reasons why I wanted to talk to you guys at this point. You're, mm -hmm. I think at this point, maybe one episode away from finishing your your rewatch discussion right or right. two episodes yeah because i think the last one i listened to you were up to about part 16 so right yeah uh we have guests lined up uh, i think people are going to be pleased by these guests but we never reveal on them in a day in, never, in right not ahead yeah. of time and not ahead of time and uh and it is um a uh so it's going to be 17 18 but also it's just going to be sort of an overview it's not really going because you know as you can see that you know we we started with john thorne we started off with a bang and uh but we quick it quickly went into oh, let's just talk about the whole thing uh so it's sort right. of a conce <laughs> it's sort of a conceit that we're uh, yeah <laughs> we, we broke it up just sort of just as a way to have a structure so let, yeah. let's come up with a number of episodes to do if we leave it open-ended uh, it'll either go on forever or we won't, and we won't finish or, you know, something will get in the way. So we, we decided to, you know what, let's do this. We'll invite these people on, uh, you know, we had Lindsay on for the last one because these were the most Audrey have heavy episodes and she, you know, has done a lot of writing and stuff about Audrey on 25 years later. So we had her on. Um, and, uh, I think that, uh, it was a, it was, uh, just a way to kind of give a structure. Now we came back to Twin Peaks, I think subconsciously, cause I wasn't thinking about this in the head of time, but it was like, it was coming up on the four year or mm. the, I'm sorry, the fifth year since the premiere. And I think when John Bernardi and, and Carl and I talked, it was the day of the premiere. It was the an fifth anniversary of the premiere. Mm. We're going to pursue this discussion down uh, deeper avenues in a moment, but before we get there. I just let people know uh, where they can find you, where your main line of work is and, and all of that. Okay. Uh, probably the place to get really up to date information on us is going to be Twitter. Uh, we're at counter We're actually at winds of the weird.com. That's our current sort of uh, subtitle is counter Esperanto podcast winds of the weird. Our email is contact at winds of the weird.com. And we're at windsoftheweird.com where you can find our episodes downloadable. But when we release episodes, they are on any podcatcher app that you may have. And, and we're also on Spotify. Uh, we come out with episodes probably every couple months. Uh, sometimes it's every five months. Sometimes we're monthly. So uh, just uh, keep an eye on us and subscribe. <laughs> and if you want, you can reach out to a mysterious box laying in a small town in a dusty PO a post office at P.O. Box 13313, Spokane Valley, Washington, 99213. <laughs> That's a lot of one threes. Uh, I, I know what happens if you write to that box, but I'm going to leave it a mystery for the uh, listeners so that they <laughs> pursue it on their own and find out. Yeah. <laughs> it's a treat. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> what has it been like? coming back to it now, because one thing you mentioned at the outset is uh, talking about nostalgia or anti-nostalgia within the return, but we're now mm. at this point that I find absolutely fascinating. And we will pause the conversation there. You can pick it up on Patreon, link in the show notes, uh, patreon.com slash lost to the movies if you want to jump right to it. Definitely check that out if you enjoyed this. Make sure to check out their podcast as well, Counter Esperanto, download it on your podcast platform 
and listen to their backlog while you're waiting for the uh, finale episode to come out. It's they've got a lot of great material there. <laughs>